everyone. Welcome to NAPHN 2020. In this session today, we are going to talk about how to make a passive house smart and why do we advocate doing that. This is Bhakti Dave. I'm a building performance analyst at Oris Group, and we help our clients achieve low energy and high indoor air quality, not just in design, but also in operations. I'm co-presenting with Matt Bowers, and I'll hand it over to him. I'll see you guys later. Thanks for that intro, Bhakti. Uh, my name is Matt Bowers. I'm the president of Rochester Passive House Consulting. Uh, we provide Passive House Designer and Passive House Tradesman uh, services, as well as blower door testing and a variety of other building science related uh, services. I'm also a certifier through Certifiers Cooperative, uh, which is a PHI accredited certifying body. And today we're gonna to be talking about my personal house. In 2016, uh, we built the house and moved in in 2017. Uh, I put together a fairly substantial blog, uh, rochesterpassivehouse.blogspot.com that has more information than you could ever wanna know about the house. Everything from the design to the uh, construction and then to the data analysis uh, afterwards. And as we get started here, uh, I, I just want to, to show everybody the, the layout of the house. So it's a two-story colonial with a full basement. The first floor is uh, a wide open floor plan. The living room and dining room are on the south side of the house with lots of southern glazing. The kitchen is centrally located and uh, we've got a first floor office that can be turned into a, a master suite. So we, we brought in some uh, live-in or age-in-place um, design into the house. Uh, the north side of the house, we have a, a breezeway that's unconditioned, that's attached to a garage. And you can see that the front of the house faces due west and there are some windows on the front of the house, but we installed a, or we built a, a large front porch. It's a 10 foot front porch with an extra two foot overhang to try to control the shading as best we could on the west side. The second floor has the same footprint, making our uh, build a much easier build. The master bedroom is on the south side of the house with lots of southern glazing. Uh, we have two full baths upstairs and then two more bedrooms for my four kids. Um, we also have second floor laundry uh, that utilizes a heat pump uh, dryer as well. So now I want to go through a little bit with you how my, uh, how my house was put together. We started with eight inches of EPS foam, uh, installed it under the basement slab, and you can see there that I have, uh, I've installed some foam board fo forms for the four load bearing posts that are going to be in the house. Uh, we ended up with about an R38 under the slab. And then uh, with the ICF foundation, we installed a two by four wall inside of that and installed Intello on the exterior side of that wall and dense packed it with cellulose to give us about an R60 foundation wall. My, uh, my walls are 16 inches thick, so they're thick enough for my kids to play in them. Not a lot of people can say that. Um, it's a double two by four wall construction with eight inches of space between the walls. The entire cavity is filled with cellulose insulation. Our primary air barrier is the zip system, and you can see the back side of the zip system on that picture. Uh, we uh, then insulated the service cavity inside the wall with damp spray cellulose. And then we installed 24 inches of cellulose in the attic. While the trusses were sitting on the ground, uh, we actually took a spray can and spray painted the, all of the cords of the trusses at 24 inches. And that was really helpful uh, for the, insul uh, the insulation company to come and they have to bury all of the orange markers, right? Um, and this picture is showing that we have 24 full inches at the outside edge of the outside wall to, uh, to reduce any, any possible thermal bridging that's going to occur. And this is the, uh, the front fi uh, finished picture of the house. We installed Zola UPVC windows. Um, and then the front door is a Zola 
a wooden, other uh, wooden line uh, window as well. Um, you can kind of see on the on the south side of the house, and uh, overall, it's an extremely extremely comfortable, quiet house. Now, as we get into the mechanicals here, um, we're going to talk about the ventilation system first. The uh, we installed a Zender Comfoair HRV ERV 350 uh, with a ground geothermal loop, the Comfo Fond loop. Uh, the picture to the right is going to kind of show the layout of where we're extracting and supplying the fresh air. Uh, now, I said HRV and ERV uh, because we certified the house with the heat recovery core. Um, and because I like to tinker, I installed the, uh, I, I purchased the ER the ERV core as well. Uh, we've, we typically swap them out um, at different winters just to come inside the house. Uh, the second floor layout is, is a very standard uh, ventilation layout. We're supplying fresh air into the bedrooms and we're supplying or we're extracting uh, stale air from the bathrooms and the laundry room. Uh, the second floor is slightly pressurized and we do have a supply in the basement. So when you, uh, when you look at this plan, the dining room and living room are actually a transfer zone for the ventilation air. This is a photo of the installation. So we ran the Zender tubing all throughout the house with the, the registers high on the walls. Uh, and you can kind of see that we had a lot of drilling of holes to do in the, uh, the eye joists. And one of the lessons learned from this project was to utilize a, an open web truss whenever possible. Um, we spent a good day drilling holes through the web of the eye joists and getting it all verified by a structural engineer. So uh, it was a very time consuming process and it would have been worth the, the extra length of time to wait for a, a, a designed um, open web truss. It's very important to label all of your Zender tubing. Um, when they all come together at the unit, it can be very confusing. So this is just a picture showing how we went through and labeled all of the tubing. This is a picture of our system installed with the Compo Fond. We've got fresh air coming in from the outside. It's going to be filtered. And then it's basically just a car radiator uh, with a small glycol loop going around the outside of the footer of the house. Um, it's about 200 feet long and really didn't require anything extra um, in terms of installation. Uh, it's got a small pump that, will kick, that the Zender unit controls, and that pump is going to circulate the glycol whenever uh, the system calls for it, whether the outdoor air is too cold or the indoor air is too warm. Uh, and then it's going to go through its heat recovery core and be distributed throughout the house. Uh, and it, obviously at the same time, we're going to be taking the air out of the bathrooms and the kitchen, and we're going to take the heat and moisture and then blow that outside. Now, when it comes to heating and cooling this house, the heat loads were extremely, extremely small and the cooling load was, was even smaller. Um, we heated the house with two 9,000 BTU uh, Mitsubishi Mr. Slim air source heat pumps. The first one we installed on the first floor, uh, very centrally located in the, in the large open space of the house. And the one on the second floor, we installed in the master bedroom. And we installed them in the master bedroom because of the south facing windows and the potential for overheating that room. Uh, if we have a warm day during the shoulder seasons, um, we can potentially overheat that room with the solar gains coming in the windows. So we wanted to make sure that that wasn't going to happen. So we put the heat pump head in the master bedroom um, and not more centrally located like in the hallway. So this is a photo of the, the first floor heat pump being installed. Uh, now this unit is mainly used for heating and it will heat the entire house all winter long. Uh, we've lived in the house now for four winters, and the first winter I didn't believe it could happen, so we ran both units, but the second winter and beyond just the one on the first floor will heat the entire house uh, all winter long. Now, the one on the second floor uh, in the master bedroom is 
only used for cooling. Uh, we will run it at uh, a set point temperature on the thermostat. Uh, and on the really, really hot, humid days and nights, we will leave the bedroom doors open to allow the second floor cooling to be better, uh, better distributed. Um, now the one on the first floor will be used for dehumidification only. Okay. Um, and that's just to help cover some of the uh, extra latent loads coming from occupants and the kitchen. Now both units are individual units. So the, the, um, the first floor and the second floor have their own condensing unit outside. And as we were building the house, the multi head units were just starting to come on the market and the efficiencies were, were um, questionable at the time because they had just come on the market and we didn't want to take any chances. Uh, it's also really nice to have redundancy. So uh, if one unit goes down, we still have the second to, to cover the load of the house. Now we installed the sand and CO2 split heat pump water heater. It was actually on the first UL listed shipment to the US. Uh, so it's one of the first ones that got installed in the US. Uh, now the photos I'm going to show here of the Sandin uh, don't have any pipe insulation on them yet. So they're fairly early in the installation process. All of the pipes have been insulated um, as, as needed. Uh, so you can see the, the two PEX tubing going to and from the tank uh, coming into the unit there. And the one on the outside or the one tank on the inside there um, obviously doesn't have any uh, insulation on the tubes is either. Now we did install a domestic hot water circulating loop and that caused us to have to put some check valves into the system. And because we installed the check valves, we created a closed loop system. So we did install a expansion tank in that uh, on the tank as well, just to cover the, uh, the extra expansion that's gonna happen when you heat the water and prevent us from popping the relief valve. Now the domestic hot water circulating loop is from Innovative or uh, Auto Hot, and it's a push button controller. So while we're in the bathrooms, we'll push the button and it'll send a, a signal to the controller in the basement and the controller will then turn on the circulating pump. Now the circulating pump can run um, about four minutes and charge the entire loop. And as the return side of the pump senses warm water, it'll shut the pump off. So it only runs for about four minutes every time you push the button and we might push it two or three times a day. Um, so it's extremely efficient, runs on about 80 watts and is, is essentially no load uh, electric wise on our domestic hot water system. So now let's talk about the blower door testing. The blower door testing is probably what I'm most proud of when it comes to this house. Um, we did four different blower door tests Okay, and the first test was done at strictly an air barrier only blower door test. Um, we, we installed the zip system, sealed our air barriers, we sheeted over all of the windows and, and doors that were larger than a sheet of OSB, we covered with uh, extra foam board uh, and we ran the test. And aside from being super, super dark in the house, uh, we tested at 83 CFM 50 with uh, an air change of 0.17. So extremely airtight to begin with. And that was good. Um, and everything that I had read up to that point said the house is just gonna get leakier because you're just gonna poke more holes in it. And that wasn't the case in my house. So our second test was done after we installed all the windows and doors. Okay, we installed the insulation and the rough mechanicals and our hose bibs. Uh, so all the holes in the house were, were basically done at this point. Uh, we ran the test again and we're at 0.15 ACH50. Okay, so the house ended up getting a little bit tighter after we, after we poked some holes in it. Um, the third test came through and it was just about a final test, but it was still a single point depressurization test. Um, the big difference there was we moved the test rig from a basement window that I'm gonna show you a picture of here in a second um, to an above grade window uh, and built an airtight rig uh, and then our fourth test was using that same rig, but doing the average of a pressurization and depressurization multi-point test. 
and we ended up at 0.1 ACH50. Now, um, according to my calculations, if we had gotten down to 35 CFM50, we would have been very close to a world record. So this is what the house kind of looked like during our first lower door test. You can see the zip system has been covered over all of the windows. Uh, the doors have a big sheet of scrap foam board over them to provide uh, that air tightness over the doors. Um, the rig was set up in the basement window using another scrap piece of foam board. And uh, this is the photo of the manometer. So we used the Energy Conservatory's duct blaster fan and uh, a standard uh, Energy Conservatory manometer. And we were at 83 CFM. Uh, for the initial test. And for the final tests, this is the test rig that we set up in the window. Uh, it was just a piece of zip system with a weather strip going all the way around it. And we mounted the duct blaster fan to that, uh, to that piece of zip and ran our hoses as needed. Uh, and then took some scrap blocks and screwed the blocks um, to the, the zip system to suck the uh, gasket tight to the window. So this is our, a screenshot of our initial multi-point test using the, the depressurization uh, method. And we were at 51 CFM 50. So that's 0.1 ACH 50, uh, great, uh, with an equivalent leakage area of 2.8 square inches. So that's, for those of you who don't know how big that is, that's about the size of a silver dollar. And we've got 49 CFM50 for our pressurization test. And my, my theory on why they're different and why the pressurization test is, uh, is tighter is when you pressurize the house with tilt and turn windows, you're actually pushing the windows tight to their gaskets. So that's probably why there's a slight difference between the two tests. Either way, absolutely phenomenal test result. The house got certified by uh, Passive House Academy. Um, and here's a, a quick screenshot of the uh, Passive House database showing all of the information. Um, again, there's a link to my blog at the, uh, on this website. And we are, we are an active participant in Passive House Open Days. So I'm constantly opening my house for, for potential clients and people who are interested in high performance homes to come in and see all of the different things that we've done. And because of that, I didn't install any PV on the house, okay? Um, it was real important to me to be able to show the aspects of Passive House without the distraction of having PV on the property. Uh, in my experience, whenever somebody comes to see a house, and see solar panels on it and they're touting their low energy bills, it's because they have solar. Uh, and we have low energy bills not because of solar. We have low energy bills because it's an airtight uh, certified passive house. And as we get into that, um, I'm gonna show you how I'm, I've been monitoring all of my energy data, okay? We've got total electric, um, heat pump usage, hot water usage, ventilation usage, and then I'm also monitoring my indoor air quality at the same time. So my my setup is is a pretty pretty uh, archaic setup. We have four uh, digital electric meters installed inside the house. Those electric meters uh, I, are allow me to do a monthly meter read and I can track my heating, cooling, water heating, and ventilation loads um, by doing a monthly meter read. So we installed the meters between the appliance and the breaker. And like I said, we're, we're measuring the energy use of my heat pumps, my uh, water heater, and my ventilation system. And by doing that, I'm able to uh, create graphs like this, right? Showing what I'm spending in heating and water heating and ventilation and cooling. And then everything else that's left over is my auxiliary electric usage. Um, and so this is the kind of information that a lot of people uh, find very useful when it comes to uh, whether or not they're going to build a passive house.
Now I've used a bunch of energy monitoring devices. Um, I've used the TED Energy Detective, uh, which was which was pretty cool. Um, but I have some uh, questions on how accurate they are. Uh, they we could only scale the CTs to either normal operation or high operation. So uh, I had some some uh, conflicting uh, some conflicting um, data. And then I also installed the Sense Energy Monitor, which senses the, uh, the electric pulse of each individual uh, appliance within the house, uh, which is really, really cool, uh, really good technology. I still have it installed in the house, but it's only really good at identifying the small individual appliances in the house, your vacuums, your coffee makers, your circular saws. Uh, it hasn't been able to find my ventilation system, and it certainly hasn't been able to find the, uh, the Mr. Slim uh, heat pumps or the water heater, which is really what I was most interested in having it be able to find. At the same time of all of that, I'm, I'm measuring the indoor air quality of the house and I'm uh, utilizing a Yoohoo right now. And this device has a really cool app with lots of fun colors. Uh, and so it's constantly measuring temperature and humidity, carbon dioxide and total VOC. PM25, um, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, ozone, and it also does air pressure. Uh, now I haven't taken a picture of the air pressure for you, um, but one quick note on this uh, monitor is uh, it doesn't publish any of its tolerances. So we don't know if the temperature is plus or minus 1%, right? Or if the total VOCs are plus or minus a half a percent and it hasn't been certified by any kind of credentialing body, whether that be Reset Air or ASTM or an ISO standard. So I'm not really saying that it's inaccurate. I just have some questions as to whether or not, how, how accurate it really is. So with that in mind, I have done some fairly sophisticated tracking with it. Um, and I'm gonna put in the chat box here uh, a link to a, a blog post that I did on the summer of heat and humidity. Um, there was a 10-day stretch uh, a couple summers ago where we were above our 1% design condition for half of the time, and that includes night and day. And each one of those data points on the psychometric chart here was a manual input by me uh, after I managed hour by hour for a 10 day stretch. Um, so that was a very time consuming uh, thing for me to do, but it was important for me to be able to, to check how the outdoor air temperature being as severe as it was, if we were still able to keep the house comfortable inside the house. And so this is information from the Yoohoo. Uh, again, each one of these data points was manually entered into the psychometric chart, but I was most uh, concerned with seeing how the house performed even in severe uh, cooling conditions. And so this whole analysis took me probably about two months to compile. And so all of this is really, really cool, right? I, I'm able to track my energy use, I'm able to monitor my air quality, um, but this type of data collection can be extremely time consuming, uh, days, not hours, right? Um, and getting this kind of information from a general homeowner really isn't practical. So we're able to get this kind of information uh, mainly because I live in a passive house and I'm interested and I'm uh, an advocate for passive house. And it's important for me to be able to have information, solid data to back up the passive house claims. Um, but it's really not deployable on a large scale. We can't ask a homeowner to, to take monthly meter reads. We can't ask a homeowner to give us access to, um, to, to checking indoor air quality and, and things like that. Um, and maybe most importantly, there's no real good way for me to analyze energy consumption and indoor air quality at the same time. And this would be really important um, so that we could monitor the indoor air quality of a room and see, okay, the indoor air quality went down as soon as we turned the stove on, or the indoor air quality went down as soon as we opened the windows, or as soon as we turned on a vacuum. So uh, being able to analyze 
uh, side by side, energy consumption and indoor air quality um, can be very, very important. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Bhakti, and she's going to take us through a, uh, a much more sophisticated uh, method of doing all of this. Bhakti? Thank you, Matthew. Now that you described how beautifully Rochester Passive House was designed and constructed, certified by Passive House Institute, and all the effort that was put in to manually track its performance in operations, Let's talk how it can make lives easier by doing it digitally and automating this whole process. Starting with simulations. There are different models for different purposes. Passive House Planning Package and Rupee Passive are design tools. There are other building energy modeling tools which are used not just for design, but to also dynamically simulate performance in operations. However, as of today, if a project is seeking Passive House certification, either from Passive House Institute or Passive House Institute US, we do need a PHPP or Woofy Passive model. So any other models from operational standpoint, they need to be supplemental to one of these two design tools. Dynamic simulations provide a real-time context as building's theoretical potential performance throughout its operational life. Most often, building's performance in operations is compared using a historian. A historian tells us if the building on any given year is performing like previous years, little better or worse. However, it doesn't tell us if the building is performing to its full potential as intended during design. Comparing simulated performance with actual operations depends on the time scale and the sources of data. Dynamic building energy modeling tools, they have capability of aggregating the simulations on monthly intervals if the only sources of information available for actual operations are either utility invoices or meter readings on monthly basis as Matt did for his house. However, if the building has utility meters and indoor air quality monitors capable of providing data on hourly and sub-hourly basis, we can use that data to compare it with simulated performance on granular scale. Com continuing the discussion about building energy modeling tools and the sources of data for Rochester Passive House. A passive house planning package was developed at the time of design and for certification by Passive House Institute. We now have an IESVE model to generate simulations for comparing performance in operations. In terms of the data source of actual operations, as we've mentioned before, the source so far was monthly meter readings for each of the sources of energy identified under key performance indicators, which was total electricity, electricity consumption from air source heat pump, from sand and CO2 heat pump water heater, and energy recovery ventilator. These graphs here, they compare the simulated performance with actual operational meter readings. The simulated trends can be seen by the dashed line and the solid line to represent the metered performance for each of the end uses. So the graph on the left, it represents electricity consumption by the air source heat pump with orange lines representing the consumption during the winter, that's for heating, and then the blue line representing the summer cooling electricity consumption. These yellow lines on the graph on the right, they indicate electricity consumption by hot water, and then green is simulated and actual electricity consumption by sender energy recovery ventilator. This graph here represents total electricity consumption in the house, 
which includes lighting, plug loads, and all other equipments, in addition to the heat pump, hot water heater, and energy recovery ventilator we discussed in the previous slide. We'll see later on how we can use the actual operational data and dynamic simulations to facilitate digital permissioning. Now that we've discussed dynamic simulations, let's talk about open integrated measurement and verification system and its integration with dynamic simulations to generate robust feedback loops. We believe that the functionality of measurement and verification system depends on its operating technology. The best way to make the utmost use of smart building infrastructure is by having an open integrated operating technology. Just to be clear, the systems that I had been using previously were not integrated at all. And that certainly added quite a bit to the amount of time that it took for me to compile all of my data. The smart building infrastructure for Measurement and verification system starts with the world of Internet of Things. IoT refers to any kind of meters and sensors that can share data over a network without human interactions. Now we all know that the number of IoT devices, they increase every year. And based on one of the studies, that number was 8.4 billion in 2017 and was estimated to be 30 billion by end of 2019. So it is very important to first identify the key performance indicators on any project and then have the smart building infrastructure set up only for the performance aspects the owner or we as project teams care about. Open integrated operating technology is a platform that connects multiple devices and systems. It allows for data logging, network management, and most importantly, communication and control over systems, unlike open protocol or proprietary systems, which are the other options of operating technology that exist in the market. Information from the operating technology is then sent to a real-time database and historian. Real-time database and historian is a software program that stores each data point with a timestamp. Different software programs have different levels of analytical capabilities. The raw or analyzed data from the real-time database and historian can then be viewed via human-machine interface. Oftentimes, people think that a dashboard is the most important element of a measurement and verification system because it's the pretty picture. But it's very important to understand that the true value of dashboard lies in all the components of a measurement and verification system upstream of it and which gives data to actually display it through a human machine interface. To understand the open integrated measurement and verification system at Rochester Passive House, let's revisit the key performance indicators. As Matt mentioned before, on energy side, they have total electricity, electricity consumption from Mitsubishi air source heat pump, from sand and CO2 hot water heater, and sender energy recovery ventilator. And on indoor air quality side, the indicators are carbon dioxide concentration, air temperature, and relative humidity. The meters and sensors at Rochester Passive House, they consist of electric utility meters for each of the end uses identified in key performance indicators and current transformers, a weather API, API is an application programming interface. So whether API enables us to access data from nearest public facing weather station from National Weather Service and an indoor air quality monitor. 
This is a Reset Air certified indoor air quality monitor, which does six parameters, particulate matter 10 and 2.5, carbon dioxide, total volatile organic compounds, air temperature, and relative humidity. And I would just like to add to that, uh, the Tongdi indoor air quality meter will be replacing or verifying the Yuhu uh, indoor air quality meter that I currently have. Uh, and I'm going to be putting those uh, da that data onto a blog, so stay tuned for that. Thanks, Matt. I'm sure that would be a great source of information for everyone. Moving on to open integrated operating technology at Rochester Passel House. We have Tritium Niagara J's. It connects all the devices, interfaces, and monitors we talked about in the previous slide. It also has data logging capabilities and internet connectivity. The information from the Tritium Niagara J's is then sent to OSI Soft Pi. OSI Soft Pi is a cloud-based real-time database and historian. Pi Asset Framework analyzes, integrates, and refines the data. All the data is finally visualized using a Pi vision. And as we can see, it helps us visualize not just the actual operating data for each of the end users identified as key performance indicators, but also its integration with simulated performance, which is indicated by the red line right here. To summarize everything Matt and I talked about so far, to achieve high performance in operations, we first need to start with a high performing design. And as we all know, Passive House is an epitome of natural order of sustainability, which is passive first, active second, and renewables last. Dynamic simulations provide a real-time context of building's theoretical potential performance throughout its operational life, which when coupled with measurement and verification system, it gives us a holistic platform to ensure that the high performance intent of design is kept intact throughout the operations. And Rochester Passive House is a great example of that. And I'm sure Matt is super proud of how his house is performing. So I'm gonna let him express his pride. Yeah, a site EUI of seven and a half. Uh, I, I guess that means I'm winning. <laughs> And not to forget annual utility cost of just $950. I'm sure most of them are paying closer to that number every month. Integration of open integrated measurement and verification system with dynamic simulation allows for multiple enhanced capabilities like automated sustainability reporting or certification management thermal comfort analysis based on psychrometrics, and digital commissioning. Open integrated measurement and verification system, when employed with appropriate platforms, can help us automate the data reporting requirements to some of the platforms like LEAD-R, an Energy Star Portfolio Manager, or the certification standards like Reset Air. Psychometrics help assess thermal comfort, and this tool provides simulated thermal comfort as a context to actual comfort conditions in the space. This type of analysis literally took me two months to do, uh, point by point, data point by data point. Uh, this is incredible to be able to pull up something like this. And we'll make sure that moving forward, you don't spend that time anymore and we'll have this ready for you. Integration you. of dynamic simulations with measurement and verification system. That's the conjunction of operational data and simulated data provides capability of monitoring based and interrogation based commissioning 
to ensure continuous optimal operations. So now we are going to go through a few examples to see how the actual and simulated data can be used to first ensure if the systems are performing as if they were intended, if there is an opportunity to do better or to make them perform even better in reality, or how can the data be used to solve problems. This graph here represents the simulated and actual electricity consumption of sand and CO2 heat pump water heater at Rochester Passive House. And we can see that the simulated performance shown by the red line fairly aligns with the black line, which is the actual electricity consumption. So we all can conclude that the water heater is performing as it was intended, designed and expected and optimally. Now, as we talked before, that the key performance indicators for energy at Rochester Passive House were total electricity, energy recovery ventilator, air source heat pump, and heat pump water heater. So the auxiliary electricity here, it includes rest of the electricity, which would be lighting, plug loads, and all other equipment that would be there in the house. And we can see that the model prediction is something fairly consistent throughout the year, while the actual operations indicate something different. I'm this, very, oh, I'm sorry, Bhakti. Now you can continue. I'm very interested to see how, um, how we can flatten that line a little bit and the impact of things like Christmas lights and uh, using more electricity during the summer, using power tools and things like that. I'm, I'm really interested to see how we can flatten that line. And it's going to be important to focus on this part now because when a house is performing so efficiently, like with an EUI closer to 7 or 7.5, it means that the envelope and the mechanical systems are already very efficient. So at that point, lighting, plug loads, and rest of the equipment, they account to somewhere close to like half of the electricity consumption in the house. This graph here represents electricity consumption by the heat pump. And so these lines, they represent the heating season, and then this is the cooling energy consumption. And we see that the model predictions and the actual operations align well in this case as well. But since we had the model, we thought that, let's see if there is an opportunity to do something better or make it perform even more efficiently. So, so you're telling me that with a site EUI of 7.3 that I can be doing better? <laughs> that's, that's pretty amazing. We think so, and we're gonna examine the air temperatures using indoor air quality monitor, which you already now have as a part of smart building infrastructure. And we'll see how the air temperatures look like over the next heating season. And then if the model interrogation could actually help us refine the operations, having said that, if your heating energy consumption could even be lowered because model indicates that there's a capability that you can use. This green line represents how well the house could potentially do. Your heating energy consumption currently is indicated by the black line. So we'll see and we'll keep you all updated what we find out next year. This is another great example of how data and the connectivity of various systems on a single platform can help solve problems. The Weekly Tavern is a restaurant located up north of Pittsburgh. We received a complaint from the kitchen staff that it was very hot in there and very uncomfortable. The usual reaction is that, well, the restaurant kitchen is not expected to be very pleasant. But since it was a complaint, we had to look into it. And the good part was that we had the data. 
So we'll go through how we interrogated the problem and help them resolve it eventually. This purple line indicates the indoor air temperature. And we can see that it peaks at 90 Fahrenheit. So it is really hot and uncomfortable for any human being. Now it's a kitchen, so it could either be internal gains or some sort of combination of internal gains and outdoor air. So we decided to take a look at the outdoor air temperature. And as we can see, the outdoor air temperature is the red line here. And the indoor air temperature is the purple line. So the indoor air, it followed the trend of the outdoor air with a certain lag. This gave us a direction that whatever problem is in there might not necessarily be solely due to the kitchen internal gains and could have something to do with the air coming into the space. So we decided to look at the mechanical equipment and the tavern has a rooftop unit which is used for heating and cooling. It has a makeup air unit in the kitchen with the exhaust hood. So this is the rooftop unit and these were the two points as we discussed earlier where the temperature was peaking at 90. But it looks like the rooftop unit was on at that time. So that wasn't a problem. However, if you see all these areas, the unit came on and off every now and then. So the operators realized that the temperature set between Dan in the rooftop unit was set to be too narrow. This gave them something else to fix, but it doesn't solve the overheating problem that we're talking about in this space. So then we looked at the makeup hair unit in the kitchen, and it looked like that was on as well. This helped us isolate the potential cause as the kitchen exhaust system, as that was the only thing which was now remaining and could have something to do with the issue. So then we had the team investigating that on site and all they had to do was first go and look at the kitchen exhaust hood. And they figured that it was just operating at 40% of the capacity. No wonder the air temperatures in the kitchen were so high because the makeup air unit was bringing in all this warm air which wasn't being exhausted. And clearly the rooftop unit didn't have the capacity to cool all that excess air down, which it wasn't designed for. And this is a perfect example about why it's important to be able to uh, data log both indoor air quality and energy consumption at the same time. Oftentimes people set goals of building to be high performing and Sometimes it's mistaken that once the building is designed and constructed as it was intended, the goal is achieved. But it's important to remember that the true goal of high performing building can set to be achieved if the building performs as it was intended throughout its operational life. And to do that, we need to make sure that we have the access to right data. By right data, I mean, the data which you can actually use to influence the operations and have the platforms and systems set up that you can access it whenever you need it. With this, I'm gonna hand it over back to Matt and he'll explain a little bit more about Rochester Past House and his experience with the automated system versus manual tracking. Thanks, Bhakti. I appreciate that. Um, so now I just wanted to kind of wrap up here. Uh, there, there are multiple monitoring systems out there, right? I have four individual meters. I've got the Sense Energy Monitoring System. I've used the TED Energy Detective. I have a Yoohoo Indoor Air Quality Monitor, and that's not the only one out there, right? So there, there are a bunch of different monitoring systems out there, and they they're, they all have their, their pros and cons, don't get me wrong, um, but there, are, there is some limited accuracy, and the limited accuracy kind of comes in when you try to combine two interfaces that don't talk to each other. Um, usually, these monitoring systems have their own proprietary um, 
set up and they'll give you as much information off of their system as you want. Um, but to download that into something useful and be able to combine it with live time stamp uh, information can be really, really difficult to do. Um, and given the fact that we're trying to, to do indoor air quality and energy monitoring at the same time, using all of these different systems, we're really not getting exactly what we're looking for. Um, and manual tracking is still going to be required, right? You're, we're still going to need to do monthly meter reads because the TED Energy Detective can't measure uh, the low amperage of the ventilation system. Or I'm still going to have to do my monthly meter reads because the sense of anything that's continually operating in the house, like my ventilation system. Um, and the, the Yuhu indoor air quality monitor is great, but it's still not talking to the energy using um, components in the house. Whereas the ROS 360 platform combines all of these units into one, right? And the, the ability to track your energy use with your indoor air quality is, is priceless, especially in a high performing house. Now I've spent probably about $2,000 when it comes to different monitoring systems, whether those are my energy meters, the sense energy monitoring system, the TED, the Yuhu, all of those, I, I'm, I've spent about $2,000 and I'm still really not getting everything that I want. Um, the ROS 360 platform will get you in the door at $3,000 or under. And then the final cost is just going to depend on exactly what you're trying to monitor, right? How many different little components are you trying to monitor? Um, so we can, we can certainly um, take advantage of any particular situation that your project might have. And now some, some really four big lessons uh, that I want to point out to everybody with respect to, to my house in particular, um, the energy monitoring systems that I have are working and they're really only working because I live in a passive house and I'm a passive house advocate. So getting that information out is very important, but it's not a practical solution to scaling to multiple projects. Okay, so that's the num that's lesson number one. Lesson number two, the 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 house has really outstanding indoor air quality, right? According to the Yuhu indoor air quality meter, um, sometimes we peg on total VOCs and we're we're investigating those causes now, but overall we have outstanding indoor air quality. Um, we also have documented extremely low energy usage which according to the simulations could be even better, but I would say a site EUI of seven uh, is, it, there's no complaints from anybody who has a site EUI of seven, um, but there still is room for improvement. And we are gonna be taking a look over the next year or two um, at what we can do to fine tune, um, fine -tune a high performing house to, to be able to, to meet the performance level that, that the simulations say that it can. And before I close, I would just, I wanna go into a quick story uh, about living in our, in our passive house. Um, the, the first night we moved into the house, uh, I had a five-year-old and a seven-year-old, okay? And um, we put the kids to bed in their, in their brand new bedroom, right? The walls were painted pink and everything, uh, two, two little girls. And uh, we put the kids out of the house, right? We were outside for, for maybe 15 minutes. Um, and, you know, we we're just like, we, we did it. We finally moved in. This is, you know, this is awesome. Um, and we were, you know, we, we finished our, our glasses of wine. We came back inside and our kids were screaming at the top of their lungs. Um, they were screaming and they were very, very upset. And a lot had to do with, they thought we had left them 
in a stranger's house and walked away, right? They couldn't find this in the house anywhere. So they were, they were scared out of their minds, but we didn't hear them screaming from outside the house as we were walking around. Obviously, if we heard them, we would have run into the house to, to make sure that they were okay. Um, but, but we didn't hear them screaming. And uh, so I, I tell that story because uh, it's real important to understand the different aspects of comfort, right? Comfort isn't just indoor air quality. Uh, indoor air temperature. Comfort isn't just relative humidity. Um, comfort is noise, right? Being in a nice, peaceful, quiet building. Comfort is the daylighting that happens in a passive house because of the, the, all of the windows, right? The windows are designed to let more energy in over the course of the year than they let out. Um, so all of the different aspects of comfort and obviously low energy bills, um, is really the, the, you know, the, the telltale for what makes a passive house comfortable. And my company's motto is we, um, we like to design homes, um, to achieve comfort through energy efficiency. And I think that, um, being able to, uh, give a house, documented indoor air quality and thermal comfort um, in live time is just a, an amazing opportunity. And it's a sales point for, for everybody out there who's, who's trying to sell passive house certification or high performance design, right? Um, your garage could be zero energy, right? If you just turn the lights off, but comfort is, is everything when it comes to a high performance home. home. And uh, with that, I would, uh, I would like to thank everyone for listening to the presentation. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to myself at Rochester Passive House at gmail.com or reach out to uh, Bhakti at bhakti.dave at arosgroup.com. And uh, we look forward to speaking with you further on this. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm.